5 tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If uh, you don't have a Bible and uh, you don't see one around you, they're the black, the black books in the chair racks. If you don't see one around, you just kind of look desperate. And somebody will probably notice and help you to be able to not only find the Bible, but to be able to find your place in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And uh, when you find it, we'll read our text this evening and yeah. really begin and ask the Lord's help to uh, help us understand the Scripture. Uh, let me give you a couple of uh, preview announcements. I hope you have some New Year's resolutions that you're planning on making. And I hope that you're a hopeful person. It's too bad, isn't it, that people uh, sometimes are just negative. I can't stand negativity, to be quite frank with you. I get really, really negative about it. And really down on people that are negative. You want to irritate me, tell me something can't be done, something can't happen, or just gripe about something. There's nothing just riles me and irritates me like negativity. And so uh, you ought to be a hopeful person. You ought to realize that God is alive. He is not diminished at all. Things are going well. God's plan is working. How many people did you share the gospel with last year that trusted Jesus as their Savior? You know, I'll just tell you, just about anybody that really hears the gospel, God works on their hearts and they get born again. The problem is, the way that Jesus described it, it's a problem of laborers. We've got a lot of negative people who should be laborers. I just believe God will save souls and preach the gospel. Are you hopeful about 2018 for people being saved? I, I am praying. We, we had a great year this year, actually. 2017 for this ministry was a fantastic year. But I am praying that 2018 will surpass it in every way. And uh, I there are some things. I just want to give everything to the Lord this year. I think we just give ourselves to God this year as a church and as individuals. God's going to do some amazing things. And we'll be changed by it. I watched this year. I witnessed, and several of you would say this is true about me. I witnessed a lot of the people in our church this year give themselves to the Lord more than they had in the past. And you're better for it now, aren't you? Doing better now than you were at the beginning of 2017. And so now, this year, even more from the Lord. Another thing I'm going to try to do, I have one more service, one more Sunday, actually, is I'm going to try to be nice uh, in 2018. I'm serious. I'm going to try to, try to uh, do, be less sarcastic in the coming year. I'm serious. I'm really going to try to do that. Mrs. Dawes, I'm serious. I'm really going to try to do it. It won't be as much fun. <laughs> well, for some people it will be. Some people will, maybe they'll come back. You know? <laughs> I don't know. So uh, just bear with me a little this evening. Matter of fact, I'm just going to be really nice next year. I'm thinking about starting New Year's Day by going on Facebook and liking everybody's posts and putting like a little like, happy emoji like on everything. All my... 4,000 Facebook friends I'm going to have by New Year's. I'm going to like everything they say every day. And just be like, that's wonderful. You're wonderful. I need a new church. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I've got some New Year's resolutions. I hope you'll like them. All right, let's, let's uh, if you found First Thessalonians chapter 5, let's read the scripture. And, well, I'm glad that you like me not being nice, Mrs. Dellins. That made my day. <laughs> All right, First Thessalonians. <laughs> what do you like about Pastor? I like that he's not nice. <laughs> uh, let's, let's look at beginning in verse 12. And I just want to read two verses tonight, 12 and 13. Hopefully it will be a simple message unless we get derailed. Verse 12, the Scripture says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love, for their works' sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Well, that's a pretty loaded couple of verses in the Scripture, actually, isn't it? And so we're going to uh, unload it just a little bit in just a moment. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us understand. Father, we do need your help tonight. God, first of all, preconceptions. We do not need this evening to approach this text of the Scripture with notions about what will be preached tonight or concepts of what the Scripture is saying. We really need to be, like every believer ought to be, open, open-minded 
to truth. And I pray that you'll just help us to have a couple of nuggets this evening of truth that we could practically live in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. So the last couple of weeks we've been in a little mini-series. And we've been dealing with the topic or the matter of leadership in the church. We began two weeks ago with just a look, a snapshot. It wasn't a full study, but a look at the church at Thessalonica and something that was just really stand out about that church. When I read Acts, it's a real help for me when I read the epistles, if I've read Acts. In other words, I see where that church got started, what happened there, the events that formed the church. So, for instance, when you read uh, to when you read the letter to the church at the Philippians or at, uh, the, uh, the, at Philippi, do you think about Paul being in prison and that being the beginning of that church? Is that what you think about when you read the letter to the church at Philippi? Well, that's kind of where the church at Philippi came from. Uh, Paul had some terrible things happen. Paul and Silas did. They were imprisoned. They were beaten. God did some miraculous things. The jailer of the prison was born again in his household. They were baptized that night. And then the apostles were run out of town. And that's where the church at Philippi got started at. Shortly thereafter, this church at Thessalonica was begun. And one of the things we looked at a couple of weeks ago was that that church was established by the apostles going into the synagogue three consecutive Sabbath days and showing that Jesus was the Christ from the Scripture, from the Gospel that the Jews had. And the Bible says three people groups were born again as a result of that. Uh, many of the men believed, the Bible says, and then the Bible says many women believed, and then the Bible says many of the Greeks believed. And then the Jewish mafia ran them out of town. They suborned uh, lewd men of the baser sort and basically uh, threatened them so much that the church, the people there, determined that it was better to have the apostles leave town just for the sake of everything. And so now while Paul is in prison, he's writing a letter to the church at Thessalonica, and he's really concerned because he's invested three weeks total time in establishing the ministry at Thessalonica. That isn't very much time, is it? You think about how a church would be doing. Okay, if you were preaching the gospel and you were giving your heart and your soul to it, and the Holy Spirit was moving, and a lot of people were getting saved, and you saw three weeks' worth of results, a couple of years later, what would be your expectation for what was established there in three weeks' time? What would be the best you'd hope for? I think I'd hope for at best that the people remembered they were saved. And maybe they gave up idolatry. I'd hope that maybe... Uh, they had met someone else that could share uh, more truth, could teach them more. Paul was so concerned that he sent Timothy, Timothus, to Thessalonica to know how they were doing. In the report that Timothy gave, you actually find that Paul said that their faith was spoken about, if in chapter 1, you don't need to read this, but in chapter 1 their faith was spoken about throughout the world, and particularly in the regions of Achaia and uh, Macedonia, the church at Thessalonica had such a reaching influence that they'd reached the regions surrounding Thessalonica. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? And then Timothy reported that they had stood fast by the truth that they had received, the gospel they would received when the apostles had preached it to them. They hadn't changed doctrinally. They, were, they believed the same thing that they were taught from the Scripture. And they were taught from the Scripture when the apostles went in to the synagogues and showed them that Jesus was Christ. And so these people hadn't changed. The church was exactly the same as what was happening except that it had reproduced itself and it's a thriving church. This letter to the church at Thessalonica is distinct from every other letter in that the bulk of the material in it is just a commendation. In other words, the first three chapters of 1 Thessalonians, which has five chapters in it, the first three chapters are Paul's commentary on how glad he is that they're doing well. And he said, and now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. 
Or he said, I, he's talking about his imprisonment at that time. He said, I'm in prison and I'm doing fantastic if you're doing fantastic. I don't mind being in prison because I'm not needed in Thessalonica. You're doing well. So we asked the question a couple of weeks ago, for instance, if you were to compare the church at Thessalonica with the church at Corinth, which had the apostles for more than a year teaching and dwelling at Jerusalem and establishing that church. And when you read the first letter to the church at Corinth, it's a scathing letter. All sorts of things that are wrong. And you ask the question, how can a church which had three weeks access to truth be doing so much better than a church which had more than a year? Now most of us want to blame circumstances normally, don't we? We usually want to take the it's easy for you because approach to things, but actually when you look at the circumstances, the church at Corinth, the, that place, the region was steeped in idolatry. Pagan, wicked, idolatry, fornication, you name it, was the description of Corinth. And then if you study Thessalonica, you see it was the exact same thing. Matter of fact, in the letter to the church at Corinth, idolatry was mentioned as something that they had victory over. So what was the difference? What's the difference? Two weeks ago I preached about this in Miami Beach, and Maggie said, Pastor, we need to find out what that difference was. I said, yes, Maggie, we do. Yeah, because the fact is, if I get to the choice, if, if it's up to me to determine, am I going to have the characteristics of the church at Corinth or the characteristics of the church at Thessalonica, which do I want to be part of? Or ask the question a better way. What does God want me to be like? The Thessalonian church or the Corinthian church? Obviously, we don't shape ourselves after men. We don't pattern ourselves after people. We pattern ourselves after Jesus. But my friend, the church at Thessalonica was to be commended, and that's what God wants us to be like. This was a great example. And we answered the question, what makes the difference in a ministry when there's a vacuum in leadership? That is, a ministry loses its leadership. Maybe uh, the pastor gets squashed by something. Or uh, God calls the leadership to another place. What happens in a ministry? Sometimes terrible things happen because of leadership. And there's a transition. And I've watched churches, I'll just be honest with you, whenever I hear about a pastor leaving a ministry, my heart, I have those, that, that chest pain that happens when you're concerned for something. And I think, oh no, what is going to happen to that ministry. One of the things we saw from Thessalonica is that what happens to the ministry actually isn't up to the pastor. It's up to the people in the ministry. The Apostle Paul really thought, you know, things are going to be terrible in a terrible way in Thessalonica because I'm not there. And he found out that things weren't in a terrible way and he wasn't there. So what made the difference? Well, the people did. The people were what were different about it. Whereas they had given themselves wholly to the Lord. Last week we looked in Acts at the passing on of the baton, the passing over uh, of the mantle, if you will, from the Apostle Paul, really the apostolic era coming to a close. And when he had transitioned to the pastors in Ephesus, remember he, was, he went by... Um, by Ephesus to Mylita on the way when he was going back to Jerusalem. And when he got back, when he was when he stopped at Mylita, he had sent to Ephesus and told the, the elders or the pastors there to come and to meet him in Mylita. I think it was Mylita. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I messed things up. Is right? Larry says I'm right, so we're golden. Okay, so anyway, uh, they came and met with Paul, and Paul warned them about some things. First of all, he shared with them the responsibility that they had. And we looked at things that ought to be looked for when a church is looking for a pastor. You say, Pastor, why are you teaching us what to look for in a pastor? Are you leaving? I was hoping to either be raptured, in which case you all need a new pastor, or, see, it's not New Year's yet, so I can still do it. 
Uh, I was hoping. Uh, no, the, the reality of it is, is that I have no plans as the Lord tarries to ever leave uh, this ministry. God's going to have to change some things in my life for that to happen. Uh, and so the answer to that is no. But you know, I think what's dangerous is when pastors don't train leaders. They don't train people to carry the leadership. And you watch what happens in ministries when they're gone. The churches just crumble. They change. We talked about good change and bad change in a church, and we're talking about bad change. So last week we looked at the things Paul warned the church uh, at Ephesus about. First of all, he said, Feed the flock of God which is among you, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. And we talked about how it's necessary to have a pastor whom God has called, whose Holy Spirit called. You say, Pastor, how can you tell that? Well, I'll tell you, the same person who called the person is the same person who will tell you that he called them. You ever think about that? Most of the time we want a textbook answer for why somebody is called by the by the Holy Spirit of God. But you know who will tell you if a person's Holy Spirit called? God's Holy Spirit. He's real, folks. You ought to know Him well enough to listen to Him and to be able to have the discernment of the Holy Ghost. It's amazing how that good leadership can be Spirit-led and how cohesive decision-making is among Spirit-led people. So you've got to be Spirit-filled. So, feed the flock of God, taking the oversight, when the Holy Ghost is made you. Then the Bible talks about um, the description of the people is that Christ had given His blood for them. And so, we said you need to find a pastor who values people. I've seen men come into churches and notice that people have problems. And in order to get the church problem free, they get rid of the problem people. The problem with that thinking is that Jesus died for problem people and He loves them a great deal. And a good solid church is going to be a church that has people that God's working on that are growing. Not a church that just allows things to remain as they are but a church that loves problem people and pastors who don't get offended or don't get embarrassed because their church has problems. Now look for that in a pastor or in a church. Church needs to look for that in a pastor. Then we saw, as well, the warning to the pastors about grievous wolves coming in and taking advantage of the flock. And we looked at the difference that a shepherd feeds the flock, wolves prey on the flock. And there was that warning where Paul said, some of you, some of you are going to be the wolves. And I can't imagine, you know, how... You know, eye contact at that time must have been really awkward when Paul said that to those elders at Ephesus. He says, you watch out because you could be... Now, he said about them, he said, the Holy Ghost has called you. So these people who are Holy Spirit called could potentially change and turn into wolves preying on the flock. And so you need to look for a pastor that has enough humility to realize that he can be the problem in a church. It's important. Okay, we're in tonight's text. I want to look at a last thing, if you will, in this mini-series. In verse 12, this is again that church at Thessalonica, and so think of whom Paul is speaking to, the, the type of a church that he's saying this to. He said, And we beseech you, brethren. Now, we know what the word beseech means, I think. It's to plead or to beg with a little bit of an exhortation notion to it. So Paul said, I'm begging you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. And I do want to notice that the them is plural here. It's not a big deal. It's not, there's not a lot of grammatical significance in verses 12 and 13, to be frank. There's not a lot you could prove from the grammar. Uh, but the plural use of them is important because it really explains that to a church that's doing well, that there's more than one individual leading in a church. Do you notice that? Do you see that? In other words, a, a strong church, a Thessalonian church, literally, has plural leadership. More than one person takes the leadership. I beg God to raise up leaders in our ministry, people who accept responsibility, and are willing to 
literally lead the folks around them. That's what we need. Honestly, one of the major, I would say, if I were just to be honest about our church, one of the major hindrances in our church is a lack of leadership, where people just say, you know what, I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to take the responsibility for it. And Paul said, know them which labor among you. The word labor is sort of a harvest word. How many of you all are familiar with agricultural uh, country? Ever been grown up on a farm? Has, how many have worked on a farm? How many here have worked on a farm? Okay, you farm workers, let me ask you a question. Is there harder work than farm work? Is there more difficult work than farm work? When does farm work begin? In the day? 4.30 in the morning. About 4, 4 in the morning, 4 a.m. is usually when farmers start working. When does farm work end? 10.30 in the evening. About 10.30 at night. We're talking about summertime. Wintertime is kind of, you know, put your toes to the fire and whittle or something, but we're talking about summertime. Okay. What is the degree of physical labor in farm work normally? In my day, because I'm old, in my day it was tough. I drew, I, when I was a kid, I ran and operated combines that were like cutting edge when my dad was a kid. Cutting edge when my dad was a kid. Now, last time I went, when my dad was harvesting wheat, he had a combine that was like a computer game. It had a joystick like this, and you just kind of go like this, and it goes forward, and you just kind of, just all these little buttons on your hand. And the thing runs itself. He has a GPS-operated steering system for his planter and his, uh, and his um, uh, sprayer to when he sprays the crops. Literally, he, he just gets in and, you know, gets the thing going, and then, you know, he sits there and rides while the tractor drives itself. Now... You know, it's a little different than it was back then. But he still has to shovel wheat. He still has to shovel uh, uh, soybeans and so forth. And, you know, hay still, they just haven't come up with good ways to stack hay. You know, and that sort of thing. So all I'm saying is it's hard labor. And the word the Bible uses for labor here is that word. Like the labor in a field, the copious, back-breaking, hard labor. Paul said, know them which labor among you. Plural. And then, secondly, labor. I fear that too often we are enthralled by flash in a pan service. You know, it's really not difficult for me this evening to stand before you and preach a message. I've preached enough times I can, I can bore people very easily. There's no trouble at all. Uh, it, it's not a lot of work to prepare sermons. I'll be honest with you, it just isn't. Um, it's not hard work. You know, the work that's real work is the kind of stuff that's not glamorous and nobody knows gets done. That's what makes a ministry go. A lot of people think uh, dynamic preaching builds a church. I wish that were so. Uh, don't, don't make fun of me and say, well, if you're a dynamic preacher, you'd have a shot at uh, checking it out. But the reality of it is, I wish that were so, but I'm a bit of a skeptic about that. What builds a church is hard work, actually. What builds a church is priority. You know, so much of the time what we do isn't what grows a ministry. What we do is oftentimes we think necessary, but it doesn't, doesn't change people's lives and it doesn't grow a church. Because the things that change people's lives and grow a church are not glamorous and they're very difficult work. And I think that's why we focus less on those things and more on the program-centered concepts of church building. Now we could get detailed about that. We won't this evening. But the Bible says, Know them which labor among you. And then it goes on to say, And are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. Now, Admonish here is it's a word that we use for counseling. The new the, oh the uh, uh, the idea of of exhorting or uh, encouraging a person and uh, correcting a person. Know the people that help you do right. 
you should be a little bit bothered when people are comfortable letting you know that they're not everything they ought to be. When someone shares with you that they're not living right and they're kind of giving you the details of it, it's one thing to say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not doing right. I'm doing this. But then, yeah, Pastor, I'm in a bad relationship. Let me tell you what he's like. You know what I'm talking about? Like, they could share with you things that are wrong and you're a listening ear. You're not an admonisher. You're not the kind of a person that would say, you know something? <coughs> It's going to destroy you. It's wicked. Here's what the Bible says about it. Once you do right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the Bible says in verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. This is great because this is cheap, and I'm a cheap person, so I like it. The Bible says esteem them highly in love. How expensive, how costly. I know, I know, love gives, love sacrifices, all those things. But honestly, how costly is esteem? Truthfully, someone serves you, they're your minister, and you esteem them. How, how tough is that one? How tough is it actually to have somebody who loves you and serves you and to esteem them? It actually, in practice, if you get it, if you get it intellectually straightened in your mind, it's simple. But do you know that it isn't often that the person who labors or ministers is often appreciated or loved? I would have to confess to you, there have been times in my life when I have looked back and thought of someone who is no, uh, just people who I just don't have to minister to me anymore, and thought, you know what, I didn't esteem them enough. That person ministered to me, and honestly, I was it was a grand privilege to have them minister to me, and it really didn't mean to me what it should have. I'm at a place, a stage in life when someone honestly prays for me. <coughs> Somebody says, I pray for you, and I know they do. I'll be honest with you that you, you couldn't tell me anything. You couldn't do anything for me that would affect me and affect the way I feel about you more than to pray for me. It's just a big deal because that's one way that someone labors for you. When people serve you and minister to you. Esteem. It's not a complicated notion, but it is one that has to be deliberately practiced. You know, a person who esteems someone uh, isn't looking for fault. When you esteem someone, you don't look for fault in that person you esteem, do you? You ever have somebody that, you know, something's really great and someone's got to pick at it? You got to point out the one thing that's wrong with it? You know, you get a new car. It's a cream puff, right? Amen. Get a cream puff. You get a car for 300 bucks with 50,000 miles on it. Somebody tells you the hood has a dent. It's like, shut up about the hood. It's a car with 50,000 miles on it. And I got it for 300 bucks. It's a cream puff. There's nothing wrong with it. It's beautiful. Those are shapely curves on the hood. You see what I'm saying? There's esteem. Esteem does not belittle or criticize or point out flaws. Esteem recognizes value and shows the value of it, doesn't it? Okay, uh, let's finish. Then the Bible says esteem them very highly in love. So how do you esteem them love? Love is not expensive, my friend. You say, Pastor, love gives. Well, ultimately it does, but you know God takes care of that part, doesn't He? So then the Bible says, for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. I want to remind you what Jesus told the disciples. If you wanted to turn there, you could, as we conclude this evening, into Matthew, uh, Matthew in chapter, uh, is it, uh, or I'm sorry, Mark. I meant to say chapter 10. Remember when the disciples asked Jesus something? This is Mark chapter 10 and verse 36. Well, in verse 35, the second part of the verse, they said, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. They said, Jesus, we'd like you to do something for us. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? Verse 36. They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, 
one on thy right hand, and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. So they asked the question, Jesus, will you do something for us? And he said, what would you like me to do? And they said, grant that one of us can sit on your right hand, and the other can sit on your left hand when you're in your glory. And But Jesus said unto them, you know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Now, whenever Jesus asks the question, if you can do something, I always... My first thought is, no, I guess not. If you're asking me if I can do it, I think I don't. You remember uh, Ezekiel, when the Lord said to him, Son of man, can these bones live? And he said, O oh Lord, thou knowest. My answer here, I think, would have been, I, if Jesus said, can you drink from my cup? Uh, I would have said, can I? <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I think so. I want to. No, they said, we can. And Jesus said, yeah, you can. He said, in verse 39, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I'm baptized with, shall ye be baptized. Well, I'll tell you, that was a significant statement, in both literally and figuratively. Uh, the night Jesus was betrayed, they drank from his cup. But ultimately, these two individuals drank from his cup. They died the death that Jesus died. Significant statement. Uh, there's a lot of theological implication in that passage, and I'm going to pass on it tonight because it isn't the point. Jesus said in verse 40, To sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. And that's that's understandable, isn't it? James and John said, Can can we sit on you? Can we be better than everybody else? And everybody else said, you know, you want to be better than us. And it bothered them. Um, in verse 42, But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. The word minister is not a fancy title like people think it is. The word minister means servant. It literally means he's going to do your work, going to do the things that you don't wish to do or can't do. He's going to serve you, minister. And whosoever of you shall be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Let me just share with you something that annoys me. Something that annoys me is when I go to a restaurant and the food isn't good. Uh, but that does annoy me. That wasn't what I was going to say. Uh, when I go to a restaurant and the server doesn't act like a server. You ever been there? Maybe it's like you're not there with your wife. You're there with another guy. You're there with Mr. Taj. And the server is like, oh, I think that guy's available. And it's a lady. And this always happens when I'm with Mr. Taj. <laughs> so, and... <laughs> The lady tries to establish a friendship with you when they serve, you know. I've had it happen before when I've been sitting and eating and had the waitress sit down at my table. I don't like that. I don't want a waitress sitting at my table. I want a waitress topping off my drink. I want a waitress making sure, not saying, is everything okay? I want a waitress to check to see if everything's okay. I want to get the food, as fast, the order in as fast as possible to start, you know, hydrating myself as fast as possible. And I want to have a conversation with whomever I'm there with. I don't want a relationship with the server. I just want to be served by the server. It irritates me when servers try to be noticed. And they ask questions just so that you know they're doing their job. Is everything okay? Let me give you a list. Again, it's, it's not the new year yet. Let me tell you why everything's not okay. Okay, first of all, you ask me if everything's okay. You should know, you know, that my glass is sitting halfway off of the table and it's empty and I've been clinking the ice cubes in it and chewing them loudly with my mouth open, letting you know I need something to drink. <laughs> my food's burnt. And you should have known it when you dropped it on the ground and it bounced on the way out of the kitchen. You know, whatever. Uh, 
In other words, a good server is attentive and actually knows what the needs are of the people whom they serve, isn't it so? And so the fact is that a server doesn't familiarize themselves with the people they serve. They serve them. You know, we've gotten that a little backward in church leadership. I'm not saying the pastor is less than the people as far as importance go. I'm simply saying that a pastor who serves people certainly isn't more important than they are, and he isn't too good to do anything they need because that's what he is. He's a minister. And Jesus told the disciples, if you want to be great, serve people. Do things for people. You're not too good for anybody. People aren't there to serve you. You know, that, I don't go to a restaurant with a thought of, I know that there are people that do this, uh, but they're wrong about it. Uh, I don't go to the restaurant with a thought of, I wonder if I'm going to have a great server that I can give a big tip to. I go to a restaurant thinking I would like to get good service. It's not about, man, I, that wait, I don't leave it going like, that waitress, oh, wow, the meal didn't matter. Sometimes I leave and I'm like, you know what, <laughs> I want to write the tip, you know, write a, write a tip instead of giving one. Now, okay. Stop being mean. <laughs> the reality of it is, is that that's what we need to look for in ministry and in leadership. How many of you would like to be servers? Ministers? It's not so much that it's glamorous, but the reward's really good, actually. It's, it's actually what leadership is. It's what makes a church like Thessalonica special, set apart. Jesus said, Whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Huh. And he illustrated it. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. He's the chiefest. Now let me ask you a question. Who was the most important individual with Jesus and his band of disciples? Jesus was. Who was the greatest servant? Jesus was. And he said, the illustration of service is myself. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. And folks, if we grow in the area of leadership in our ministry, we'll grow in the area of people who step into places of unglamorous, <coughs> not necessarily thanked or rewarded service. If we grow as a ministry, we'll grow in the area of recognizing what service is and loving and esteeming those who serve. So those are our two points for this evening. Let's thank God for them. Father, thank you for what you taught us this evening. And I pray that you would help us to absorb and to apply what we've learned. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's take some prayer requests uh, real quickly. Okay.